this morning we have a very different subject than the one last week, or the last lecture, because we are going to explore a field where, for the most part, efforts have failed. We are trying to discover a little more about life. Not life as time, but life as energy, life as vitality, life as consciousness, will, wisdom, and action. And in order to understand these principles, we have to do something that is against present policy. We have to turn to the past. At this moment, the world is very conscious of the present and fearful of the future, where much of the problem rests has been ignored, and that is in the past. Now, the past is something more than dead yesterday. And uh, to overlook it is to lose the most wonderful text for the study of our problems, because none of these problems are actually new. They're all part of the descent of a stream of life. And this stream of life is the thing we want to consider. Some years ago, uh, General Furlong, in his Rivers of Life, gave us a chart showing the development of races, sub-races, and a great arterial system of life descending through history. Everything in this list and everything in this chart is, is actually very scientific, very factual, and uh, probably more readable and usable than the histories that we write today. We are therefore interested in trying to understand something of the principle of life as we accept it, as we know it, as we live it, and as we pass out with no understanding of what it is, or very little understanding. Now, at the present time, there are two attitudes towards this subject. The first is materialistic and scientific. Now, the study of science in relationship uh, to the vital moral and ethical development of races has been generally neglected. The uh, modern scientist is interested in what he calls facts, and facts are to him the actual occurrences of today, the actual checking that he can make of things on the physical level. He does not really try to figure out why these things happen, but he is interested in how they happen. He does not know or recognize any particular reason for these happenings, except they occur as the effects of causes that are set in motion in our daily existence. The true and complete materialist does not believe we existed at any time except now. He does not believe in any of the theological doctrines of immortality. He does not recognize a religious principle behind physical phenomena. He is concerned typically with what he calls facts, and all of his facts are more or less physical. When the facts are not physical, he is very suspicious of them and would prefer to reject them entirely. Therefore, the scientist makes physical phenomena the fact of existence. Everything exists because of certain phenomena. And life itself is one of these tremendous energy factors with which he is concerned. He does not know where life comes from, except in the physical sense, through the perpetuation of species. He does not know about the overtones which affect the conduct of human beings, because to him these things are merely passing shadows on the surface of a scientific factuality with which he is completely absorbed. The result is that as far as moral and ethical development is concerned, the scientist has to depend upon another factor if he wishes to develop any of the overtones of ethics. 
he has to divide his attention and admit the existence of something above or beyond science. This he hesitates to do because he feels that the moment he passes from the fact, he passes into a mirage. All overtones to him are simply the longings of the human soul for something beyond the physical. And the scientist is very doubtful if there is anything beyond the physical worthy of consideration. Now, on the other side of this coin, we have the religious point of view. We have that of the individual who, by nature, believes in the reality of the wonderful. He believes that there are principles at work constantly, that life is not simply a drifting along through a mass of physical phenomena. Life is the unfolding of a plan, a purpose, that there is a divine power at the source of life. He has his problems trying to prove this, but also he has certain points that are worthy of consideration. To the theosophist or theologist, as the case may be, the physical phenomena of life is more than merely the unfoldment of bodies. Life is a stream of some kind, as shown by Furlong in his Rivers of Life. Life is an unfolding process going on constantly. It has passed through one cycle after another. It continues to move cyclically within the boundaries of law. Somewhere in this great pattern of motions, there is an ethics. There is a tremendous purpose. There is a valid reason. The theologist is not always sure what that reason is, but he believes in a divine power at the root of life, and that this divine power is the source of good, and that this divine power must be cultivated within his own life, and the principles of it applied to society. Therefore, he has his point of view, but as far as the scientist is concerned, his point of view is scarcely adequate. The scientist is, says the theologian, in order to have the point of view that gives him hope and idealism, must ignore a vast order of physical phenomena. The theologian, on the other hand, says that to get down to the level of physical science, the scientist must ignore a mass of superphysical phenomena, which he cannot deny, which he cannot disprove, but he finds difficulty in accepting within the boundaries of science. Therefore, we have the scientist as a person actually moving in a physical environment. When he thinks of history, he thinks of physical history. When he thinks of the future, he thinks of a future of scientific historicity. He believes in the unfolding of forms, of the constant enlargement of human empire. He believes constantly that the human being is the master of all things in the material world, that the human being is the lord of all he surveys, that he is constantly being challenged, but that growth, progress, and unfoldment are the result of the pressures of human occupation and exercise, that the physical world is being built by material means, and that these material means are largely under the general supervision of the scientific concept. The, the perfectly scientific person, therefore, would be a perfectly lawful person, but he would live within a very narrow rule, a rule of materiality alone, because there's no place in his system where the immortality of the soul or the presence of a divine trinity at the basis or in the foundation of the material quaternary. Now, with these two points of view, we, we need history. We need to take something that is now being generally ignored. In fact, we are almost invited to ignore it. We must not think of the past. The moment we think of past, we become involved in morality. The moment we begin to examine the structure of human history, we become in the coming to the presence of a tremendous ethical structure a structure of moralities, a structure of laws, a structure of principles. Most of these have been set forth in the great religious histories and philosophies of mankind. Now, if we accept the reality of tradition, 
if we accept the fact that history is a valid instrument of knowledge, and it was one of the valid instruments of Lord Bacon in his Nova Morganum, or the new instrument of knowing, we then have to realize that in history we have to study the concatenations of events in a way that we do not do at the present time. In other words, we do, the average person is not interested in the law of cause and effect. He doesn't know why it functions. He only knows that it interferes largely with what he wants to do. And as a, he goes along his way, that which comes in conflict with his ambitions and his purposes is considered to be unreasonable or at least unpleasant. So that the person today tries to avoid the challenge of cause and effect. If he goes back into history, he will find a hundred empires that fell from the same mistakes that he is making. Now this should mean that history is a valid subject. History should be taught in schools because it is the story of what happens when we do certain things. And we have proof that these happenings are inevitable and immutable. They are just as scientific as anything advanced by science. But because they deal with moral, ethical, or spiritual values, science prefers to ignore them as not provable. Yet they are provable. History is what proves them. And the, until we can prove definitely that uh, the developments of life on this planet survive against historical mistakes, we have to consider history as part of the story. Now history tells us that there is a pattern by which all things in this world move, and uh, what uh, Furlong calls the rivers of life. In the Bible, four rivers rose out of Eden and made uh, fruitful the earth. Rivers of ethics, rivers of morality, rivers of religion, of religion, religions of, of art and science. All these things are great institutional structures built upon the man manifestation of history as ethics. So we look around and we see that certain things always happen. Now we come to a group of people who do not care whether they happen or not. One of the reasons being that they have never studied sufficiently the records of human action and activity to re realize the importance of these things. The young person in school today is taught of told that now we are living in the grand age of all things that are wonderful, and therefore the past is made up of a group of primitive wanderers struggling against the advancement of science. This is not true, but this is what the average person is inclined to believe. He is inclined to believe that now is important, that everything should be judged by now. We should judge the TV programs by now. And if we do that, we're in kind of difficult situation. <laughs> and we must also beware that we must judge nuclear physics by now and by the building of more nuclear plants. We must judge the result of destruction of our environment by now. Everything must be today. And the reasons why we're in trouble are neatly evaded because they interfere with our good uh, spirit in doing what we please regardless of consequences. So we then begin to study what these things all add up to. Now when it comes to this point in the view, we have now two systems. One believing that there is a principle of good, and the other believing primarily in a principle of skills or uh, ethical, physical pursuits and pr progressions. Now in this we have to try to study something. Of course, in religion, deity emerges either as a person or as a principle who becomes or which becomes personalized. We consider deity as a supreme power of the source of life, and that this supreme power has the right and the power and the privilege to cause any series of consequences that are necessary for the fulfillment of its own purpose. Now just what that purpose is, is not very clear. Whether this purpose is to prove the existence of deity, 
or whether it is intended to result in the perfection of creation is a matter that is still open to considerable debate. For the general point of view is that the will of this power is the perfection of all that lives according to some code of perfection, which at the present time is largely physical. The perfection may call for something better than physical, but the uh, reason for it is the conveniences of physical life, such as, for instance, the end of poverty, the end of crime, and the end of many vices that arise which are against the common good of society. So now we have a problem that goes right back to this concept of deity. Deity is supposed to have been the power that created the human being. Humanity is a projection of deity into manifestation. Why was this projection necessary? This is a question that is constantly uh, under consideration. If we wish to assume that deity is all-powerful, omnipotent in every sense of the word, why did deity not produce its creation perfect to start with? After all, why should deity create an imperfect structure and then demand its perfection through a series of what to the average person consists of misfortunes? Where and how is it that humanity, being a product of the divine mind and the divine will and the divine soul, should not have been developed perfect in the beginning. Why should there be this tremendous struggle against the evils of life? Why should the individual be required to constantly stand against his natural inclinations? If he was intended to be perfect, why were these inclinations embodied into his structure? Why was he made imperfect if the divine power can produce perfection? Why should the individual be in constant conflict with morality and ethics if he is a principle that uh, has ori origin, uh, origin in a divine power that is perfect in morality and ethics? This question has been asked time and time again, and it seems to be one of the great hang-ups uh, hang in the development of an ethical world principle. Why is man not perfect? if he is the product of perfection. And if he is not the product of perfection, why does he hope for perfection if the only power that exists cannot bestow it or does not bestow it? Now, there has to be an answer to this. And the material scientists take it very simply. There is no such thing as a control demanding perfection. The human being is a growth an unfoldment of physical forces and factors. And in, uh, enfolded within it, this picture, this being, is life. Life, integration, and a power to grow, to become, and to propagate. These things are inherent in forms, but they do not contain within themselves any strict or certain form of ethics. They are growth, producing right and wrong. And right and wrong are finally sorted out by the results of action. The individual who has enough experiences gradually comes to certain conclusions. This theory, however, has been subject to a number of reversals. At the present time, we have more intellectual knowledge than ever before and less ethics. We have de developed a tremendous growth of materialism away from ethics, away from morality, and away from principles. Now, if the, if the scientific process is complete, and of the final end of all things is the production of a self-sustaining creature, a being that is sufficient to all its needs, then science is in trouble because it isn't producing such a creature. If, on the other hand, only morality and ethics, temptation and gradual moral growth can produce perfection or produce release from problems, then why and how does this come through in our theological uh, studies and considerations. So we come to a very interesting problem here. Namely, let us now say that we are going to think in terms of a different concept of what humanity is. We thought of humanity as a biological miracle on the physical level and a psychological miracle on the religious level. But perhaps there's something else to the thing. 
be something more that we haven't investigated at all. And that is, what is the basis, basic structure of life in this world or any other, any other created sphere of life? What is life in this sense? Now, the ancients had another concept of this, which we have generally overlooked. One of the oldest forms of, of uh, symbolism for life is a river. It is a stream. And in most philosophies of antiquity, this stream of life is flowing out of a cause. It is like a stream rising in a great mountain and gradually drifting down the side of a hill, gathering small ripplets to itself, until finally, with a tremendous crash, this stream of light falls into the sea. And this is the great cycle of life, that this is life moving inevitably towards infinite differentiation and finally into ultimate reorganization and reintegration. That left all, instead of thinking of life as simply an energy in the, in the sense of humanity. Let us think of humanity as an aspect of life, that life itself is a forever ensouling power. It is continually unfolding itself. And this great stream of life, which we call humanity, is one tremendous entity, an entity which is, according to some of the Hindu philosophies, composed of nearly 60 billion single entities. That what we call humanity is a, is a vast energy, a vast concept and complex of motion, life, integration, and power. That what we call the human being is a member of this great society which we call humanity. Humanity is one structure, one being, one substance. And this humanity rises within the unfolding of universal phenomena. It arises not in materialism, but in the great process of nature and nature's labors. Namely, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Therefore, we are thinking now not of humanity as a series of individuals alone, but humanity as the one being which we call the human being. We find this in the ancient uh, religious systems of both Christianity and uh, ancient Hebrew systems from which the Old Testament was derived. We find, therefore, that there in, in the Old Testament the, that Adam, Adam Kadmon, is not a person. Adam Kadmon is humanity collective. There, there is one mysterious power, this being, is one being. And this one being consists of all individual human beings considered together and moving together in the great river of life. And this river of life is being moving to the perfection of itself. This is a little abstract and a little big to think about all at once, but it gives us a very important clue, namely that we are moving together along a pattern that is intended to bring about certain definite results. In other words, we are not paying for past sins, nor are we then doomed to make more sins and nothing else. We are here to grow, to unfold the potential which, potential which we call human, which is one of the innumerable levels of life in the infinite universe. We are one creature, more or less, uh, cast away like Robinson Crusoe on a desert island but not cast away outside of the divine purpose. Cast away to prove and justify that purpose. We are here to achieve the growth of this being which we call humanity. This being is made up of an infinite number of separate personalities, all growing together. This great being which we call the humanity also breaks up within itself into a number of races sub-races and divisions, all of which are part of one structure, this one structure being a level of growth in the universe, a level that has become part of everything, just as much a justified fact as the development of solar systems or the development of planets 
or the development of various continents on planets. These things are growth symbols, and humanity is an entity growing. One entity, made up of an infinite variety of individualities. This was the point that was made by Herbert Spencer, that man is an infinite variety. And when we think of man, we think of mankind, not as a person, but as the person composed of all the individual members of the human life wave. Humanity becomes, therefore, a life wave, a life motion in space, a life principle with which we must all become more and more uh, aware and properly informed. This bear one principle, therefore, is not here to be punished, it is here to grow, and the symbol of that growth is simply a child. A child is a symbolic unit in this great process. The child is not born to suffer. The child is not born to make mistakes. The child is here to learn through trial and error to develop the potential of itself. In other words, by growing, the individual overcomes the stasis which we call inertia. Everything in the solar system is growing. Well, races grow, nations grow, nations and races break up into subdivisions. They can pass through all forms of temptations and problems, such as a child growing up. And this child is not going to be stronger by having temptation removed, it, because this would be contrary to the production of a mature race, a race capable of taking its place among the great galaxies which populate space. So we are part of a, the population of space. We are part of a plan which we don't know the end of, and probably will not for a long time. But we know we are growing for a purpose, that this growth is proper, natural, and if resisted, can be the source of complications. The moment we resist the motion of becoming better, we loose all kinds of sorrows upon ourselves. The child is not punished in nature, simply before ignorance. It is, give, it is presented with means of overcoming ignorance. But if it refuses to accept this information, the child may pass through a series of very trying experiences, not because anyone hates it or anyone wants to destroy it, or that God has forgotten it, but because growth is the great reason for existence, whether it is in space, in the family, or in the world. These things are part of a great unfolding order of life. And this unfolding order of life is the thing that is important. Now, when uh, the scientist says we should forget all about history and forget all about the past, he deprives us of a great textbook of, of, the, of experiences and their consequences. There isn't a single problem that we face today, except possibly nuclear physics, and even that is questionable, that has not already been faced. We know very much what happens to nations that drift away. We know what happens when a, a society loses its ethics. We see the ruins of the past, and in every case, these ruins stand for the misuse of power. Generally speaking, every nation has gone down to disaster, like every individual, through selfishness, through lack of self-discipline, and for ambition to power or wealth. They've all gone down from that cause. So we very carefully avoid mentioning that cause, because it would interfere with the prosperity of the hour and might tempt us to improve ourselves. If the, this temptation became strong enough, we might become a comparatively intelligent race. And that, in turn, would be a great distra distress to those who want to exploit us. But these things are not God punishing us. They are the laws of life, the, the simple principles of integrity, asserting themselves over the various ambitions and vicissitudes of human nature. Therefore, we live in a reasonable world. We live in a world in which all things are growing. We are reliving in a world in which cooperation is inevitably necessary, but we are still striving desperately to maintain competition. 
we are definitely in need of one religion that we are afraid we might get it. And instead of working towards it, we do everything possible to keep the barriers up to cause various denominational intrigues and uh, ambitions. Everything that would tend to solve things, we are afraid of. And yet we have to face these things that are right. And the power of destiny, as it was known to the ancients, is the power that says this is going to happen. No matter what we do, we are going to grow. And if we grow the easy way, we can have pleasant gardens and a pleasant life. If we decide to grow the hard way, we will have war and strikes and conflicts and plagues and uh, various inquisitions as long as we resist the natural law of life. In other words, what we call our environment today is our school. A great moving mass of life with a certain specific destiny, humanity, an entity in space, a collective. Meanwhile, we have human collectives, then we have another collective, the animal collective. We have these units are vast entities representing laws of living and levels of existence with unfolding in one magnificent environment. And this environment is suitable to protect them all, fulfill them all, and bring them all to the perfection of their purposes. That stands between, which is ego selfishness, which is a desire to compete for power, when there can be only one power, and that one power is never on the side of exploitation. The one power of to be one is real. Anything to divide this, break it down, and make difficulties for it is illusion. So now we have we can clear the the purposes of life and realize that the universe is not run by despots. It is not run by deities that cast off suns in front and moons behind. It is a great integration of unknown origin, but of absolute honesty and perfect intelligence and infinite love. These things are the great realities, and these are, these are the things that were predestined and foreordained before the beginning of the world. And the only way we can get out of our present difficulty is to begin to move as a unit in the direction for which we were intended to move. Now, because humanity is made up of many different groups, we also have a series of subdivisions within the great structure of human humanity. We have racial subdivisions. We have various types of psychological differences. We have religions as units. We have all kinds of unities within the one great unit. And all of these unities within the one are compatible. And until we find they're compatible, we're in trouble. We are going to be in trouble just as long as we fight each other on any ground. Because actually, whether we know it or not, the one that fights and the one who is fought is part of the one that never wa wants to fight or never wants to be fought. In other words, we, no one can, we can affect no, afflict no one but one of our own kind. We can affect nothing de detrimental except by injuring the great unity of ourself this unity of the human being. And we have got yet to learn the idea, the, the real principle of the brotherhood of man. We have to realize that the great power behind things, it, it wants this civilization, this culture, this great world order to succeed. It must succeed because there is no such a thing as a failure in the divine plan. It cannot fail. By the very nature of itself, it cannot fail because it is infallible by substance, by essence, and by reality. So we can fight with it for a long time. We can oppose it for ages. We can put down 10, 20, 50,000 years of war up and pillage that has no bearing upon the essential fact that it must end regardless of how we realize or how we think. First is the realization of the brotherhood of man, and secondly, the realization of the identity of all that lives. These principles could become a solution to the constant pressures of our day. Now then, when we go a little further into this matter, we begin to study the various effects of life upon these points. 
Now, every finally, if we consider this grass unity as one, which it is, the Adam Kadmon, the one that is made out of the stardust, then the other mind, a small one, the physical Adam, so-called, A-D-M meaning in Hebrew a species or a kind, not a person. Then we have the problem of this little Adam. And this little Adam is ourselves. This little Adam is each human being, because each human being is a galaxy. Within our skins and in the various structures of our body are as many worlds, planets, and mysteries as ever anywhere in space. We have an inner space that is filled with life, just as the space in which we live. This space lives in us as we live in it. This, this space which is ourselves, consequently, represents a pattern that we must all follow. In order to fulfill the purpose of our personal lives, we must make sure that this space is maintained properly. We must be certain that we do not betray or falsify this space content in ourselves. We must become good and faithful overseers of this mystery of the body. And in the uh, story of the biblical history, we find that the ego or the self becomes, in a sense, the custodian of the body and the custodian of the laws of living. So we can go as we wish in this problem. We can become good and faithful servants, keeping the laws of health to the best of our ability. We can keep the laws of mental and emotional health to prevent psychotic conditions arising within our nature. But where we lack discipline, or where we permit details to take over, where we permit a grudge to become a dominant in our lives, we begin to reap the sorrows that the nations have when they have grudges and wars. For every inclemency of our own body be becomes symbolical of one of the larger inclemencies of the world in which we live. So we have a very interesting problem here to think about, namely that we are a unit of life moving through infinite space. We are a unit of life composed of a vast mass of units. Now, we notice something that's very interesting about this. We assume that the real purpose behind this all is growth or unfoldment. Now, we, considering the human life wave as a unit, we then consider how many entities are in this life wave. Why, how many souls or beings are coming in and going out to constantly keep alive the, the great forward motion of the entire. And the various uh, questions have been asked on this, and perhaps it's, we can use the Hindu answer as well as any other, because it's, uh, it, leaves, it gives an idea of magnitude. Uh, their theory is that the human life wave consists of approximately 60 billion entities. That is the life wave to which we belong. Now, obviously, these entities are in a constant process of coming in and going out. They are in, uh, uh, here all the time, only a fraction. The same might be true of this problem of the unity of humanity as we know it. There are human beings born every moment. There are human beings passing out of life every moment. But humanity moves forward steadily, gradually increasing in number. The population of the planet on which we live, the human population, 2,000 years ago was less than 200 million for the whole planet. Up to after that time, it began to increase. Now, does this increase represent more entities? No. It merely represents more of the great cycle coming into embodiment at one time. If the 60 billion are sitting there, or are lying in put in the suspension, awaiting embodiment. Those who come in become a, 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 like the children are born in and can come, go to school. After a certain length of time, they grow older and pass on. In each generation, a few more come in. The, uh, through, through the progress and growth of, of, of uh, uh, life on Earth, more and more human beings come in. Until now, we have altogether somewhat near 
but probably six billion human beings. Up from 200,000 to six billion. Now this doesn't mean that there is one single new soul in the world. It doesn't mean that there is one iota in different, of difference in the planet. It simply means that gradually vehicles for the manifestation of human entities are improving, growing, unfolding, and making possible more to come in and take the lessons of life with us. Little by little we have built it up, and we'll probably build it up more and more. If we reach a, a population of 10 billion, then one, t one uh, sixtieth of our entity field will be in, uh, incarnate at one time. This is important because it gradually means that the life wave is moving gradually into objectivity. The life wave is more and more embodied, and embodied is becoming grow growing more all on time. With every increase in population, therefore, new scholars have come in to go to school. And those a few who have graduated disappear or vanish away, but they are in no way substantially changed. There is no death in this pattern. There is only a constant changing toward the better. Now, this is a very large concept, and it's a concept that must be given a lot of consideration. But it is also a concept which contains within it space for growth and it takes away from us forever this fear of eternal damnation or from the scientific point of view eternal oblivion we are growing up as a being in space there are other beings there are animal kingdoms there are plant kingdoms there are mineral kingdoms and even minerals grow although it's sometimes difficult to point it out but ourselves described definitely the growth of metals in the rocks. And I have seen one this alchemist here, a little old gentleman, who had a little tiny gold tree that had grown in a rock and was still growing, although it was depending on a small piece of rock. Everywhere things live, grow, and fulfill something. Every form of life is part of something coming forth to go to school to go to learn the lessons of immortality, to become perfect as their Father in heaven is perfect. And this whole pattern has in it not one single moment of, air, of, of evil. It has not one moment of selfishness in the pattern. These things are the result of the individual not gaining a proper insight into the problems of the life to which he belongs. So we can say definitely, for a moment at least, that what we call life is a motion of a great wave of entities into manifestation. That these little waves of, ment of entities are everywhere in space. That we are by no means the only one. That within our own little planet, there are several of these great waves moving at one time, all compatible and all misunderstood, all fought against by the very persons who should be fighting for them. Now, in this particular time, which we are, we are we're worrying about, we know that uh, the resistance to growth has become greater and greater, and the errors of mortal mind have become more and more difficult. We are rebelling, we are rebelling against life, whether we realize it or not. Anything that does not dignify life is against it. Anything that does not help it to grow, injures it. Now all of these things that are good and bad are not tremendous. It is not a great crime or a great sin for any individual to want to be happy. We all want to be happy. But we haven't found out yet that happiness lies in the keeping of the rules rather than the desperate effort to escape them. We have a feeling that if we can get rid of all law and order, we'll be happy. This isn't true. The more we get rid of law and order, the more of lawlessness and disorder we have. So each individual becoming a student, or is this the Mule Rosicrucian formula, a, an ABC Darian in the College of the Holy Spirit. That is exactly what we are. The College of the Holy Spirit is the complete environment in which we exist. The, the matriculation of, of the great group of entities 
is a an entry of a group of entities into a great educational cultural system that is completely idealistic, that is completely real, and which will only may be perfected when human beings keep the rules. Now may uh, there, there are deities of, of ancient times who were the deities of rules and laws. There were deities of wisdom and truth and help. But all of these deities are symbols of rules. The God of health is the symbol of the individual who lives according to the laws of health. Everything that goes as it should is to, does so because of its order and because of its reality and because of its integrity. These things we have to face, and we like to think of ourselves as perhaps a, a vast ship upon a sea of infinity. And on this ship, like Noah's Ark, are all the living creatures of the world, all on the great journey from here to there, which in reality is from ignorance to wisdom, from the unknown to the perfectly understood, from that thought of to that which is lived, and from the uncertainties of error to the certainties of reality. All these things are part of a great plan of life. Life is itself a moving power, carrying within itself all things that live, and everything that lives is under the laws of life and under the rules of it, and the only way we can have happiness and peace is to abide by these rules. Now in the daily problems that we face all the time, there are things we can bear in mind. Everything that advances unity helps to reveal the strength of the common pattern. Everything that reminds us that we are one is a force for good. Everything that puts us against each other to fight and struggle and to compete for authority and power, all these things are illusions. Now we say, the uh, individual leaves here. After having 70, 80, 90, whatever it is, or less years, the entity retires. Now where does the tented entity go? What happens to it? What, uh, does it cease? Does it pass into some kind of a Hades, as a theological entity might be considered? Does it pass into oblivion, as science would dominate, they say? What happens to it? The answer is, according to the wise, that it returns to the ocean of the race of which it is a part. It becomes again a part of the great structure of totality. But each time it comes back, it brings with it another grain of reality. Out of every life we learn either from our action or because of our action that there is a certain truth that we again to gradually accept. For instance, uh, maybe for 50 lives, we have been feuding with various circumstances. We went through a certain life, we feuded with the family, and went off by ourselves and died lonely. Another time, we feuded with the government, became radicals, and sometimes maybe we were executed for heresy. On another time, we were feuding with the economic system and put on great strikes and so forth. All the time, we were against something. And that being against something kept bringing us back because we hadn't learned the lesson. The more we fight, the more certainly we'll come back. Because the only answer to not coming back is enlightened peace. This is the only way in which reality can survive. But each time we go back into that source, that great complete collective, we carry with us germs and, tra and traces of wisdom that we have learned. Before we pass on, we have learned that the struggle was wrong. Before we pass on, we may learn that wealth was no blessing. We may have learned that intemperance was not good, or that narcotics could destroy or protect, uh, protect, prevent the, the development of our inner lives. These things go back into the unit, and gradually the great being, humanity, gradually becomes wiser in all its parts. Little by little it grows, each individual contributing one tiny grain of truth to the construction of the entire. And in the course of time, truth will survive. And every, into every into entity in this great cycle of, say, 60 billion, 
A plenty will have learned the same lessons and will form a complete and perfect unity. From that time on, we will have an enlightened race. This is the race of the heroes, referred to by the Greeks. This is the eternal and divine race that occupies space, and will, which goes on to the next step of the great unfoldment towards reality. What is the end, the very end of it, we do not know. But we know that every part of it is perfectly organized, perfectly integrated, perfectly reasonable, and eternally good. And that the only difficulties we have are the ones we make for ourselves. The only difficulties are those in which, in our self-will, we struggle against the inevitable. As Bami, the mystic said, German mystic says, self-will, this was the fallacy for which fell the angels. So the angels represent the disobedient ones that try to stand against and create what St. Augustine calls the city of Babylon as opposed to the city of God. But everything, that wherever there is a rebellion, it seems as though a little group of these souls, these, this one entity type, make little kingdoms of their own here and there somewhere in space and put over these people uh, kingdoms the various tyrannies of their own making. This is true of all, of all the races that are developed within the great body of humanity. Each of these races is a vital organ in the structure, just as it is in the, in the political world. But each of these separate races is separate because it has not yet achieved unity. But it may have achieved considerable advancement in certain matters. And finally, advancement brings the realization that all knowledge that is real knowledge is compatible. Advancement of self must ultimately re re result in the advancement of all that lives. Unless it does, these little kingdoms fade away. The little tyrants come up in the world, the little tyrants come up in the family. The little tyrants like this come up in business enterprises, each one trying to dominate the world or dominate the little environment in which it lives. This struggle for domination is the recognition or the acceptance of separateness the existence of the idea that each individual is working for his own salvation for regardless of its effect upon other people. This is completely false. Everything, regardless of what it does, must work for the common good or it will destroy itself. Therefore, all competition is really a thing in fighting itself. Competition is humanity opposed to humanity, whereas cooperation is the recognition of the unity of that which is actually indissolvable. There is nothing but unity. Unity and pri private pride or private enterprise for the aggrandizement of self at the expense of the rest. So we find all these factors working to produce what we call life. And a life, as I like to think of it perhaps, is a great motion toward oneness. It is emotion towards unification, emotion towards the reality of integrities. It is the individual moving with other individuals to the fulfillment of purpose. And between the individual and his ultimate goal is ignorance. And this ignorance is not is evil any more than it is evil that a small child cannot work calculus. Ignorance is a natural state of things. The matter problem is that you do not educate ignorance to become more ignorant. You educate it to overcome itself. You make wisdom take the place of ignorance. Therefore, in little by little, we overcome all differences, all separateness, and become what we were intended to be, one people under God. Under this full purpose, we also become aware of the vast idealism at the source of everything. We do not know the nature of the infinite. We are not able to grasp that which is completely beyond our comprehension. But we have symbols of things that seem to point towards this. And the great symbols of life in religion and philosophy and art and music and even in science are symbols of this infinite purpose. All knowledge is under law. 
All awe is under God. And the gradual realization of this can help the individual to restore the problems of his time. Today we are worried because materialism is rampant upon the earth. We fear that we will be finally destroyed by this ignorance. We cannot be destroyed by ignorance. We can only injure ourselves by ignorance. We cannot prevent the plan, but we may reduce ourselves to a very sorrowful, miserable, repentant attitude because what we have done to injure a purpose that was right and proper. The proper end of all growth is peace. It is the realization that by working together, we advance the his history and nature of all life. We do not think of ourselves as being close to planets. We sit on them or live on them or we look at them through telescopes. But we do not realize the brotherhood of stars or our own union with this base firmament under which we exist. There is only this one great plan divided into numerous levels, into numerous departments to help us to meet the growth problems of existence. So if we can start in a little bit by, by thinking no longer that we are exterminated by death or that we go to rest in heaven for the virtues we hope we have and probably do not have or that we return into incarnation to pay for our sins. These things are negative. They are interpretations of great truths, but the interpretations are not right, not proper, therefore do not have a validity, the less. By misinterpretation, we create empires, and these empires fall. By proper interpretation, we create empires, and empires live. Therefore, everything depends upon building with the law instead of against it. There is no more rebellion against truth but only a fading away from error and a recognition of the sublime dignity of the truth that we should be recognizing at all times. So that we have no more the problem of primordial sin. Sin is ignorance. Ignorance is inevitable to the newborn child. It doesn't know. But it contains within itself the potential of knowing. Sin may be part of the life of millions of human beings today. But this is not because it has to be. It is because they have not as yet released the constructive powers within themselves. Therefore, education is not really a cramming on of sciences. It is a release of the internal the benediction of understanding by means of which whatever we think suddenly becomes clarified into a great witness to truth and reality. All these things become essential elements of a great system, a system in which there is no failure, a system in which there is no punishment except the individual who finally has to admit he's made a mistake and is very greatly humiliated thereby. But he has to admit that he has the wrong point of view. Now we are working today to clear up the problems of nations. We are trying to find some way of bringing peace to nations, but it must not interfere with our private enterprises. We must have peace, but we must not in any way interfere with the accumulation of wealth or the building up of power. We must have these uh, good things that we want, but we must not take change ourselves in any way to deserve them. So what is the result? An impasse. Error cannot survive. Good has not been brought into focus, and may we continue day after day the fight between selfishness and truth. And up to now, uh, truth has been coming out second best because we are too concerned with the little things about ourselves. The things we haven't forgot, haven't remembered, as is found in some of the Indian philosophies, is that there is only one of us. The human race is one being. If we treat any, anyone else, we are treating only ourselves. If we destroy something, or someone else. We are destroying a fragment of ourselves. Every evil afflicts mostly the individual who causes it because it releases into action negative factors which will help to destroy all the purposes of life. If therefore we can imagine ourselves as a beautiful stream of 60 billion souls shining in the light, a beautiful dream or 
the beautiful structure coming down from the great mountains of infinity, making the land fertile and finally flowing into the sea, which is the mother of life. And from the sea it is picked up again and carried to the mountains. And it goes on and on. And this is the essential burden of Taoism. That in Taoism, life is like water. And it is under the control of the power of the sun. And it is this that causes it to rise, and this is what permits it to fall. That this constantly going on results in a world beautiful, verdant, well-ordered and beautifully maintained until the human being comes in, pollutes the water, destroys the air, and tries to achieve his own particular purpose at the expense of nature, or one being, until finally the great purpose is temporarily thwarted. But the law is such that no matter how much we must, many mistakes we make, we cannot win with mistakes. No, can the mistakes destroy us. They can only humiliate us. They can only restore our final faith in the realities of life. But in the end and in the purpose of things, they are good, even though we have tr trouble facing them when they occur. So we let us think of life, therefore, as a great stream of eternal power, the very life blood of deity, the infinite of space, that which is no is, is, unco is unconquerable, that which is inevitable, that which is eternal. And in this flow all the races, nations, and peoples of the earth. And they're all flowing eternally towards unity with truth, unity with beauty, and unity with love. It is only our own selfish self-centeredness that breaks us all up into wars and camps and political systems and conflicting uh, psychological entities. There is no reason for these things. There is nothing finally except this tremendous motion of life towards the fulfillment of its own divinity. Now, when this divine life finishes itself, when we finally come to the point where all of these entities have unfolded the potential which is in them, what happens? Then, according to mythology and legendary, we give birth to another race of gods, another race of divine beings that become the parents of worlds, the parents of systems, and take their place in the great hierarchy of eternal growth that goes on forever, beyond the stars, beyond the horizons, beyond the infinite, beyond the galaxies. This, there is nothing. We do not know what lies beyond. We do not know the infinite good because we have not achieved the finite good as yet. But it's coming, it has to come. And in the fullness of time, we will see that we are one being flowing through time and eternity to the fulfillment of the purpose for which we were intended. We do not know exactly what that purpose is, but we know that that purpose rests in the mind and heart of the deity, deity at the source of life. The principle at the source of life ordains that we shall achieve and shall become co-workers with the angels and the archangels in the forming and shaping of destinies for worlds as yet unformed. It is a great system of eternal growth, and we should be very glad because there is no place in it for the infirmities of failure. They are all instances in a great success, and we must view only the great success and let that be the will of the power that we seek to serve. Well, I guess that's for the moment. Now, I'd like to make an announcement at this time. Probably many of you are aware that William Eisen, a very good friend of ours here, and many of you, a friend of the society, and one of our speakers, passed away on Sunday, October 8th. Mr. Eisen was scheduled to speak here on Saturday, November 11th, on the Kabbalah. Before this lecture, uh, the, that morning, it will, that morning will be given by Isabel Klein, Klein, Klein who uh, and uh, we will have a, they will have a short memorial service, and we plan also to remember 
Mr. Eisen, who was really a very fine person, a good student, and a person dedicated to the integrities and ideals for which we are so concerned. We know you will all join with us in a brief moment of prayer or meditation to bless this soul on its journey. Let us unite for a moment. So mote it be. Another soul goes forward to new experiences in the great stream of eternal life. And that where we all belong, and in the presence of that, there is nothing to fear, everything to hope for, and a full realization that in the fullness of time, each of us will, co will fulfill the destiny for which we were intended. So mote it be.